Thank you. Thank you so much. Kerry from uh, Cold Technology Services and uh, Lisa from uh, President of Diligence and uh, former Executive Vice President of Salesforce. Such a pleasure to have you here again, Angela. And uh, next, we move to fintech and trends driving the future of banking. A truly important topic as part of WebEd's Global Impact Week and particularly day two focused on economic sustainers. Our moderator again is the wonderful Spricha Srivastava, who is executive editor at uh, Business Insider. And uh, she will be in um, discussion with um, Thomas, CEO of Nikhil, BMP Pariba Group, and Catherine, co-founder and CEO at Cabbage, along with John Egan, CEO at Lateleo, the PMP Bariba Group. Let's see how this panel is going to, to happen. Of course, um, it will be most probably one of the most challenging one, having the moderator like Spricha with us. Spricha, welcome back. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webit panel on FinTech and the future of banking. This is a topic that is close to each one of us and has become a part of our daily lives. We have an extremely interesting panel here and I'm very excited to introduce them. We'll start with opening thoughts and we'll keep it to two minutes each, but then I'll go on about the question and answers. And I would like to keep the conversations open and lively. So please jump in, raise your hands if you have, if you have thoughts and would like to jump in. We've really seen the fintech sector boom uh, more so in the past few years and take over the traditional banking in many ways. I remember when I was at CNBC about two years ago, um, I remember I was writing the story about uh, a report that McKinsey had put out and the, the report stated the top of, top of the report, it said, do or die for, for traditional banking. And it said that uh, that report in 2019, I'm sure the numbers have changed now, but it said that banks only, traditional banks only set aside 35% of their IT budgets to innovation and reinventing strategies. Whereas FinTech players spend more than 70%. That number was absolutely uh, amazing. We'll find out if this still remains true. I have, we have veteran bankers on our panel. Um, I would like to start by going to our panelists for a short introduction. Tell us who you are, what you do, and a little bit about yourself. Um, so I would like to start with Thomas. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you uh, today. So I'm Thomas Courtois. I'm the CEO of uh, Nickel. Nickel is, um, is a what we call Neobank, uh, born in France and expanding across Europe with a simple ID, providing one account with uh, one international MasterCard available in uh, tobacco shops, essentially in France. Um, and uh, and uh, with, uh, with this simple product and simple uh, distribution, we reached uh, more than 2 million uh, customers uh, now. Um, and I'm so very happy to share uh, my experience with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, let's go to Catherine. Hi, I'm, co I'm Catherine Petralia, co-founder of Cabbage. We help small businesses manage cash flow through a variety of solutions like um, lines of credit, checking accounts, payments, and cards. We were acquired last year by American Express. And I love talking about fintech, but I also like talking about the fact that it's not new. It actually has been around since the 50s. And the banks were the first fintechs when they adopted electronic payments. And we had interesting things like ATMs and cards and things that allow customers to bank anywhere, anytime. And I think it's really democratized access to the banking system. And I'm excited to see that continue. Thank you. That's great. Um, and let's go over to John. Thanks, Priya. Um, my name is John Egan. I'm the CEO of Letelier. Letelier is a wholly owned subsidiary of BNP Paribas Group. We build data engines that analyze massive amounts of data to help us do quantitative foresight work on future technology trends and social trends. Um, and prior to that, I worked at Anthemus Group, a fintech VC in London for a number of years. And my Thanks, thought on, on, on the marketplace at the moment, I suppose, I think the over the last 10 years, both banking and fintech, which are somewhat distinct, have both been shaped by a low yield environment, uh, low interest rates, uh, more than anything else. I certainly don't think that fintech would be where it was today if money wasn't so cheap. And banks obviously wouldn't be where they are today either if it wasn't for yield compression. 
And I think any conversation about the future of both spaces needs to be had within the parameters of what we expect inflation and interest rates to look like over the next decade, because higher interest rates could mean a significant slowdown in fintech progress and a significant improvement in the fortunes for our banks. That's great. Thank you very much. And you guys have made some very interesting points. And again, welcome to the panel today. But I uh, am very intrigued because I know Catherine said that um, fintech has been around for years and it's evolved so much. It started out with ATMs and so many other things, but it's evolved to a completely different uh, model that it is today. But John also makes a very interesting point about how all of this is because we've been in a very, uh, you know, sort of low, uh, you know, accommodative monetary policy environment. Uh, we've had low interest rates. We've had quantitative easing. So where do we go from here? Uh, what do we see next? Because banks are now, central banks are now talking about uh, getting the rates back up. We are seeing that push really from central banks. So my two questions I have for the panel: one, where do we see fintech going? if central banks start to really um, you know, strengthen their monetary policy, tighten their monetary policy. And second is we've seen fintech evolve so much uh, over the years. Um, what's next really? What, what is it that you, know, you all sitting there uh, in your organizations at C-suite executives, what do you think about? What is it that is keeping you awake at night when it comes to innovation and, um, in, these, in this particular sector? So I'm going to uh, throw that question open to the three of you um, and you know, whoever wants to jump in first really. I'm happy to start here. Uh, it's a, this is a topic that I have lots to say on, so I've got to try and truncate it into something which is usable. But um, I think this is the, the determining characteristic of the last decade when it comes to fintech. It's an extraordinary thing that we've seen over the last 10 years. I think I can say this comfortably with, with Tamar and with Catherine, because what Tamar created at Nickel was something extraordinarily elegant to bank a cohort of individuals who typically didn't necessarily have access to, to, to traditional banking in an extraordinarily elegant and simple way. So that brought people in. But for a lot of the neo banks that have emerged, effectively what we were seeing was private capital, private equity and venture capital being invested in companies so that they could achieve retail banking returns. Now, that's an extraordinary thing because retail banking returns are minuscule if profitable at all in most major retail banks with, with millions and millions of customers. So the premise on which it was built could only ever have existed in a low yield environment. There's no way that fintech could have seen, like neobanks in particular, could have seen the emergence they've seen over the last 10 years if it wasn't for low yield. And I would seriously question the sustainable future of any neo retail bank in a higher rate environment where you have to buy deposits at the rates that some of those uh, neo banks are currently trying to buy them. If you're taking venture capital that expects to return a compounded yield of 12% annually, and you're investing that in retail deposits that you're going to make a it just you know bips off annually most of the time, that's obviously not feasible in the long term. So you're hoping is that there's a, a wealth proposition, that there's a capital accumulator prop, accumulation proposition that you can potentially develop. And I think that is, that is going to, as we begin to see inflation creep up in a lot of areas now, I think that is going to shape much of the next decade for, for this space between fintech and, and for, for banking. And uh, you know, I think that for banks, if, we, if you break banking down very simply into four different pillars, you've got the first pillar being the central banking function, the money supply. The second pillar being the money multiplier, deposit takers in the economy that are able to create more money. The third pillar is uh, the rails and infrastructure of finance. So transaction, custodial layers, payment layers, etc. And then the fourth layer, fourth pillar is product. And most fintech exists in that fourth pillar, the product pillar. And they're doing a much better job at doing that. I'm sure we'll get into why that's the case. But those other three pillars are ultimately where the majority of finance exists. And you have to begin to look at those and see if they're changing. Now, in that third pillar, we're seeing the emergence of major tech firms, the likes of Amazon and Apple, beginning to play a role. And you know, Facebook's intention to create a metaverse also will require financial infrastructure situated within that. So they're likely to play a role in virtual custodial networks, identification, et cetera. The second layer, money multiplier as a deposit taker, it's under threat, but not from where you think. 
in my view, where it's actually under threat from is, is central bank digital currencies. So the real threat to deposit takers right now is central banks issuing digital currencies, digital fiat, which can then algorithmically manage the money supply. So you no longer need deposit takers in the same way as you did previously to manage the money supply. So if banks are really looking for a threat right now, it's not coming from fintech. It's coming from their own central banks who are about to release a proposition that seriously undermines their deposit taking capacity, which then seriously undermines the license that deposits have or that banks have. And that's a huge corruption of the partnership between these massive licensed institutions and the governments that administer them. And I think that's the real threat that we're likely to see over the next 10 years. Thank you, I, Catherine. Yep, go for it, Catherine. <laughs> Sorry, I've been jumping in the bit. So obviously coming at the from the other side, um, from a fintech uh, a modern day, whatever, however we define fintech today, um, I, I think we think about it from the other side of the equation. That's a very technical explanation of how banking works and how banks make money. And it presumes that, say, a neobank, for example, not including things like trading or lending or payments or all the other products that are out there, <clears throat> that, that, that those structures are necessary for them to, to operate. And in Neobank, many of them are looking at offering other products that generate revenue that have nothing to do with deposits. What's interesting about all of these fintechs is they operate in partnership with banks largely. PayPal, for example, does have, you know, state money transmission licenses. They have banks abroad. They have bank licenses abroad. And Square now has their bank license. And you can see even in the evolution of Square, what's happening with the fintech. So they started with payment processing for super small businesses. Then they added cash, then they added lending. And so before you know it, they're actually serving small businesses with almost everything they possibly need. And Cabbage has taken a similar approach coming at it from the lending perspective. So I think the difference is, I think about it in terms of customers, what do customers need? Where are they? <clears throat> what, where do they want to get it? And they don't really care necessarily about getting it from a bank. Maybe they want to store all of their savings in a bank because that makes sense to them for now. But as far as transacting goes, many young people in particular are leaning towards Findex because it's giving them more of what they need when they need it. And that customer relationship, that disaggregation of the customer relationship that's occurring, the banks run the risk of being relegated to utilities because all they're doing is providing payment rails so that money can move from one place to another. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. And over to Thomas now. Yeah. I fully agree with uh, what John and Catherine uh, just said. Uh, clearly, the, the emergence of uh, new banks have been allowed by uh, uh, easy funding, let's say, uh, on the market. With uh, and uh, and some new banks raised uh, huge amounts of money to to develop their their offer, and and uh, and they also could develop their client base because. They, they build a new customer experience, let's say, that banks could not provide uh, because, uh, because neobanks uh, use a very, very new kind of technology and, and, and built an IT system from, from scratch. And so they, they built a new customer experience from, from scratch based on um, really on customer needs. So, and, and, and banks were faced with uh, uh, old legacy system and and it is it is difficult for 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 them to adapt their their their, their client journeys their their processes etc and so that's why neo banks could emerge on the market because they could find the the money to develop themselves and there was uh, a time to market because they brought a new customer experience so that's why we we see um, the emergence of of these neo banks for for now but uh, I, I fully agree with uh, John that it could be jeopardized by a change in the environment and especially in the cost of funding. Um, that, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that I also fully agree with the fact that there is a huge complementarity uh, probably between bank and neobanks and, and many of them work together uh, actually. And, and this is typically the case for, for Nickel, for example, as we are a, a subsidiary of, uh, of the BNP Paribas Group as well. So, um, and, and some other uh, neobanks have been acquired by, by banks, but this is not only the only way to cooperate and, and some uh, distribute the products of uh, other banks, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many kinds of cooperation uh, possible between bank and neobanks, and we are more complementary rather than really 
competitors in, in the sense that I don't see a neobank fully replacing uh, an, a traditional bank, let's say. Uh, and and now the, the last point for 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 neobanks in in their future, the key is the profitability, and and uh, what I can see is that few neobanks for the moment are, are really profitable. Um, there was a study uh, uh, made a few months ago saying that among uh, more than 350 neobanks um, around the world, only uh, 13 of them were, were profitable, and, and nickel is, is one of them. And I think that this is very key uh, for the sustainability of these models. Uh, at some point, they have to, to show that they can be profit profitable, and and it will be the key in the future. Spria, can I can I build on Catherine's point? Yes, really? go for it. I'm actually very aligned with with what Catherine said, um, even though it might not have come across to that originally. But she said something about banks become utilities, which is is the great terror in old bank boardrooms. This is for ten years now. This is what everybody has been terrified of. And I think that concern is misplaced. I think banks are wrong. Banks should become utilities. Um, that should be the objective that we see time and time again. You can't be the platform and the product both. You've got to choose one side of it. Which are you going to be? And banks have an opportunity to be the platform. And there are six utilities that banks can do better than anybody else. And they already do most of them. You've got capital. You've got uh, identity, security. Uh, you've got data, you've got compliance, and you've got risk. You know, those six things are what banks do fundamentally at the core of the business. What banks should be looking to do is provide those six utilities onto an open platform through which products can be built upon by product specialists who can really focus on the rationalization of profit within that domain. And banks should focus on user management and platform management. But the second side of that and I think this is really critical to the emergence of fintech, is that since 2008, where we have seen massive inflation is in asset prices. And you've got a generation of people that left university post-2008 who didn't enter the traditional economy in the way that would have been expected, and now work in very different types of jobs. And we've seen the emergence of those jobs. But one, also, one thing we've also seen is that lack of traditional... Um, economic development at an individual level has meant that a lot of people under 40 never expect to own a home. They know it is not feasible for them. House prices are too high. Wages have not risen at the same rate. And as a consequence, they know they're never going to own their own home. Or if they do, it's going to be maybe a small apartment somewhere, but it's not going to be what their parents' generation had. And that's really important because one of the primary relationships around which a bank functions with its customer base is the mortgage. And if the mortgage is removed for a large constellation of people, well, then why would you go to a bank when you can go to uh, a, like a range of neobank propositions that exist on your phone that can offer you really well-developed and well-delivered services? So uh, just to, to build on Catherine's point, not to oppose it at all, but I, I think that the utility thing is something which banks have gotten wrong. And I think, again, bringing it back to big picture, if that relationship disappears through the mortgage because younger people can no longer buy a home, that's going to be very destructive for banks. Right. Thank you. And Catherine, did you want to respond to that at all? No, I think I think we all were together. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. But I think that it's um, I think it's a great point. Um, and those six things are interesting. The only thing I would mention is identity and risk. I think we saw um, in the US anyway, through the Paycheck Protection Program, the large banks actually struggled to verify identity for customers who they had not previously verified and it made it hard for really small businesses to get access. So I think yes, in the processes that exist, they're good at that, but I think there are ways to do it faster. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about emerging markets now and move a little bit away from what we've been discussing, because we are also seeing emerging markets experience this fruitful growth, this massive growth of innovative financial technologies. And just to give you an example, like, you know, for instance, through the pandemic, we saw companies like Paytm, for instance, in India, boom, and they filed for IPO as well. We're seeing more uh, examples of that across the board um, in emerging markets. Um, if you, if I was to ask you what you think is the impact of fintech in emerging markets, how was, 
how do you think COVID-19 sort of helped in, in some ways helped in some ways, you know, sort of challenge emerging markets? Um, you know, what would be your experience on that? I would be very keen to hear from you all on that. And, I mean, whoever wants to go first. Catherine, I'll, if you want to go first. I'll start. Um, so my experience or my, my information is shaped by um, my activities with an organization called CARE. I'm on the board there. They're a global humanitarian organization, and they've had for a long time a program called the Village Savings and Loan Association, which is somewhat digitized, somewhat not, but it's a way to get access to capital for women in communities um, where they might not have previously had it. And there are lots of other companies that are coming in to, again, democratize access to some of these financial services, companies like Tala, of whom you may have heard that uses really interesting data like mobile phone data to identify how long someone's been in contact with someone else as sort of a measure of their potential performance in the future. I will say that in a lot of these geographies, they've already leaked frog the US anyway, in a number of ways, especially when it comes to mobile, because, you know, they didn't have laptops and they didn't have, you know, Wi-Fi and necessarily or or or, um, or wired Internet. And so I think the mobile devices have really opened up access to a lot of these products and services. Paytm is a great example. But I think what we're seeing is this great leveling of access that didn't exist previously to bring more and more people into that economy. The other thing that I think is interesting is crypto. Um, I'm not a huge crypto fan, but what I do think is interesting is for people who are living um, in places where there's a lot of volatility in their currency, this, you know, digital currencies potentially give them access to a less volatile way to save their money, which I think is pretty exciting. Thank you, yeah. uh, Catherine. Thomas. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Uh, with Nickel, we are not uh, present in, in emerging market, but what, what, what I can see from my position is that uh, really uh, fintechs uh, through innovation uh, have been able to, to create a new market and to expand uh, and to democratize um, a full range of, of services. Um, for example, I'm very impressed with the development of a new bank in, in Brazil or of uh, mobile wallet, mobile money in Africa with M-Pesa, with Orange, uh, with uh, Youp and, and some other experience. So really, um, through innovation, fintech have been able to, to, to democratize a full range of financial services, starting from payment. Uh, and at some point, this is also what we have did with, uh, with Nickel, as John uh, mentioned it uh, in his uh, first intervention. Uh, we could also expand the, the market in France by addressing people who were in some point excluded from the tra traditional banking sector. Because with technology, with a real-time uh, transaction, etc., we could manage the risk of this uh, fragile population. And so we brought an, the service to people who were ex excluded from the service before. And, and this is also what we see at some point in uh, in emerging markets as well. Thank you, Thomas. John, over to you. I don't have a great deal to add to this point, Spurio. I think that generally speaking, though, banking should reflect the lives of the people it serves. And um, that obviously historically has not been the case, that the world has operated according to a European banking model that has developed over the centuries. And that was not appropriate for, for much of the world, the way the world lives, the ordinary day-to-day -day needs and behaviors and long-term needs and behaviors of people. Of course, what technology and development over the last 15 to 20 years has done, especially with mobile, has provided a more adaptable, flexible way to service financial needs that are dissimilar to what more Eurocentric or developed markets look for in their, in their financing requirements. Thank you. And Catherine, you mentioned crypto, so I have to ask you all about crypto. Um, I cannot not ask you about crypto. Um, one, what are, your, what are your views on what's really going on in the crypto market at the moment? And second, do you see yourself embracing cryptocurrencies at some point um, as part of your, your uh, you know, organizations? I'll respond first. And as I said, I'm not, you know, a huge investor in crypto. I, what I get nervous about, I, I love the distributed ledger. I think that's when I first saw a demo for Ripple, like eight years ago, I thought, oh my gosh, this is really going to change the way money moves and potentially make it so much easier for emittance to occur globally. And that hasn't happened. We haven't seen that at all. Um, and, I, and I wish we had, but, um, but I, I worry about the volatility of the currency. I worry that it's not to anything in particular. There, it's not a fiat currency. There's not a government to back it. I sound like a banker. I know that, but I, I really agree with maybe what you guys are going to say. I don't know. 
Um, I think there is a place for it, but I mean, there's just like, just like what happened with Robin hood with people investing without knowledge of what they were doing. You know, people who were you know, new to investing, who lost all of their money and their parents' money and terrible things happen. I think the same thing is happening in crypto right now, but we haven't seen all of the downfall yet because things are still moving up and to the right. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, John, Thomas, any comments? Uh, I should say I, I have invested in, in crypto for a number of years. I know the space reasonably well, and we actively work on, on the digital asset space within Latelia quite extensively. Three years ago, we did a, a really major project on NFTs at the time. Um, uh, so we've kind of been, we've been immersed in the space for a while. It is a little bit similar to how 1990 felt pre.com bubble. Um, there's quite clearly value there in a number of instances, and there's quite clearly a lot of trash as well. Um, it, the, the group, and like a lot of banking groups at this point, haven't really established what their philosophical, you know, what their standpoint is on, on crypto generally yet. Um, I think, though, that you've got to divide it into its, the, the taxonomy is important. You might be, you might not be a, a Bitcoin maxi, but that doesn't mean you can't see the value in Ethereum as a layer one protocol. Um, a, you might not believe in a lot of the old coins which are emerging now, but that doesn't mean that you can't see the massive benefit to all of the people in Vietnam who are using Axie Infinity to earn an income um, and, and other plays you earn games. Um, yeah, again, you, you might not believe in, in DeFi as a proposition, but it is difficult not to look at the emergence of NFTs, a, a protocol layer that allows for the creation of unique digital assets and ownership of, of assets in a digital or virtual space, as we see the inexorable and inevitable emergence of mixed reality environments that are going to surround us everywhere and the lensware infrastructure, which all these big companies are developing. We are going to see a digi-physical metaverse emerge over the next 15 years. NFTs will be critical within that. So it's very difficult. I think I, my, my point of view in this would be that Anybody who looks at the space and just blithely wipes it away and says, oh, this is of no interest, is, is wrong. Um, they, they are, that, that's naive. Uh, at the same time, anybody who is bullishly maxi on the entire space is also naive. It is very much, it feels like we're at the crest of a wave. It's enormously overvalued, certainly as a result of, of massive QED over the last number of years. Also, potentially, as a result of what's happened with stable coins and, and the fragility of the commercial paper behind those stable coins and, and, and the opacity has enormous crypto QED occurred with stable coins. Time will tell. Um, so I think there's the market is overvalued. I do think there is enormous value within some of those propositions. But deciphering which is Amazon and which is pets.com at this point in time is a tricky thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Thomas, can you yeah, hear what you have to say? Maybe to, to add on that, uh, let's say that today we have more crypto assets rather than cryptocurrencies, let's say. And, and so the value of, of Bitcoin uh, can be very chaotic because at the end, it's just the, the belief of, of, the, of, of people owning Bitcoin. So, uh, but uh, I, I, the, so today uh, we, we have crypto assets whose value can be chaotic but the technology uh, is is very interesting and at some point i i think that uh, i mean cryptocurrencies can have a future if they bring value to all the people and uh, if it is easier safer to pay in uh, cryptocurrencies rather in uh, ra rather than in uh, euro or, or us dollar at some point, the usage will expand. But, but today, it's more a question of, uh, let's say, speculation uh, rather than something else um, for the moment. But I can see that the technology is very interesting, that even central banks are looking at it. And if we can build something uh, which is more convenient than uh, the, the existing euro and US dollar at some point, uh, they have a future. I, th I think it's pretty, very simple, but uh... there's, there's two major things that we all need to take away from the emergence of crypto. Right. And, and one is that 
money in the traditional sense is not working anymore. People don't believe in it. Massive QED over a long period of time has resulted in either explicitly or implicitly people feeling like this is unfair. This is not working. And the second side of it is, again, coming back to that point I made earlier, there's a generation of people for whom traditional economy is no longer working. They have no hope of being socioeconomically mobile in their lifetime. They know their kids are going to be worse off than they are. The average person can no longer afford, average person on average wage can no longer afford an average home close to where they, they work. And all of this has pushed people towards an environment where hope endures. There's opportunity in crypto. You hear stories all the time about the person who, you know, on Reddit a few years ago, there was a famous story about a guy who remortgaged his home and invested it all in Bitcoin. Like, And, and for every one of those, there's 10,000 horror stories, but hope exists within this space at the moment. And that is seductive. And I think that that's the real lesson we should be taking out of it right now is that traditional economy is no longer functioning for a large, large constellation of people globally. And that is turning people towards new opportunities that maybe maybe far exceed traditional risk thresholds. Because what have they to lose? That's yeah, that's a very interesting point you've made, John. But I'm also I'm, I also look at a lot of this with the view of skepticism, unfortunately, because I'm a journalist. Um, and one of the things that I I feel that you know it's great that we've got these success stories around crypto. We had a lot of success stories around when when there was the GameStop mania earlier this year um, on Robinhood as well. But then you know something like crypto is not regulated. There are still a lot of risk factors that come into play. You also have scams like the squid coin earlier this, you know, earlier this month where the people just you know, randomly put so much money into it and it turned out to be a scam. So we will continue to have that. So my question one is, of course, yes, you know, we see this um, friction between traditional methods and the new methods. And you know, so one, is there is there a need for more financial literacy? How can we ensure that people are, and is that a responsibility that the banks have? And the second question that I have is, we, uh, what does it mean for traditional forms of banking? What does it mean? Uh, are they going to be obsolete? Or what, what is the responsibility that they have in the future? Um, and again, throwing that question out there to any of you. This is, this is the consequence of massive quantitative easing. I don't think there's one agent within this value chain who's necessarily responsible. But we decided to pump out trillions and trillions and trillions of new dollars. In doing so, massively raising asset prices and reducing yield and making it so that a generation of people who didn't yet own assets were far less likely to ever own them. And if they did own them, would make less money off them. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you know, we've breached that kind of, we've corrupted that relationship. So you, when you've got a, a large constituent base of mass affluent people, like people who are earning good money, but are unable to access yield with their disposable income and their savings, yeah, that, that is a real issue. If you put your money in a bank now, the deposit interest rates so low that you, you can't expect financial security into the future by doing that. So when deposits are no longer of interest to people, where does money go instead? Um, and I think that that is, I'm not sure if I, I totally agree with you, by the way. Like it is, it's unfathomable if you go back 10 or 15 years that people, individuals would even be buying their own equities. Never mind extraordinarily risky assets that are effectively, it's like betting on horses when you don't know the finish line. So you can bet on a horse that's kilometers behind all the rest of the horses, knowing that if this horse now wins, the payoff is going to be enormous. But you only do that when you don't know where the finish line is. The finish line is there. We just can't see it yet. At some point, there will be a correction in the form of a cataclysm, and a lot of people will get burned from it. But we don't know when that is. And up until that point, there's going to be plenty of people who make stupid decisions and in doing so end up with stupid money. Like They'll make massive returns, and those stories will be delivered time and time again, and that will attract more people like moths to a flame to this roll of the dice. But we ultimately will end up hurting a lot of people. We don't know when. We don't know how to regulate it. It's not that there's one agent that can come in and correct it. But this was the consequence. 2008 should have taken decades to remedy. Instead, we decided to buy our way out of it at the time by securitizing an unknown number of years of future incomes. Unknown. It could be a century's worth to pay for it at the time without increasing productivity. And this is the consequence at a retail level of that level of quantitative easing. We're still living in the shadow of 2008. And because of quantitative easing, we will continue to live in this shadow for decades and decades to come because the next crash will be directly derivative to that one as well. So I don't know if I'm willing to pull, point the finger at, at one agency as responsible for fixing this threat. 
Thank you. Um, any any more responses, Catherine, Thomas? Either if you want to jump into that. Plus one, couldn't agree more. Lots of great academics who are supporting that point as well. There's a really interesting book called Engine of Inequality written by Karen Petru. She's a um, runs a consulting firm in the U.S. and it basically says that exact same thing. And as long as we're not measuring um, the outcomes that are successful for everyone, but only for a few, we're not gonna we're not gonna see the outcome for a long time. Well, um, from my part, uh, I will say that uh, predict the future is always very difficult. And uh, so my answer as a CEO of Nickel, I mean, and to, to develop the company and, and it is really to follow customer needs. So it's, it's my 100% of my focus is on that. Uh, ensuring that I follow customer needs and that and that I constantly answer my cost, my clients needs and 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 so this is why uh, we didn't uh, touch uh, uh, cryptocurrencies for the moment within nickel we don't offer cryptocurrencies for for our, our customer we know that it can be very profitable but in the long run I'm very uncertain that it is a, a good uh, advice for, for, for our customer. And so we really take care about that, that in the innovation we bring to the market, we, we fully answer customer needs and that we don't put our customer at risk neither. And this is our vision to develop the company in the long run. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of different point of view uh, from what uh, uh, John exposed. We are not in the same uh, level, but I mean, in, in the development of the, of the market and of traditional banks and, and of neo banks, I think that the survivors will be the one answering the best to, to their customer needs. That's my point. Thank you. That's great. Very interesting point of view there. Um, I want to now turn to John, because I think you said in one of your past interviews that commerce will take place in metaverse. Um, very keen to understand what that means. And uh, yes, I mean, everyone else, please share your thoughts as well on the matter. But John, I want to get started with you. So this has obviously become much more topical in the last few weeks with Facebook's announcements. Um, but the, the metaverse is, is a concept that has existed for, for decades now. I think you go back to William Gibson in the 60s. The term itself was coined by Neil Stevenson in the 90s, you know, dawn of the internet age. And it was the, the kind of the promise that ultimately there would exist this immersive interactive dimension within which creativity was endless. And we were all gifted the possibility of creating a world of our own design. And that was the idea of a metaverse. It was also couched in this dystopian reality at the time as well, that this was potentially an escape from a world that no longer serviced us effectively or gave people an opportunity or a chance. So there's a lot of nuance to the concept, but what we can clearly see now is that technology and economy and social circumstance has reached a confluence that is driving us towards this environment where people spend more and more time immersed in these virtual environments. And the possibilities are endless. It's really quite extraordinary. But what we can see at the moment is the emergence of the language around them. A lot of companies coming from a VC background, there was a time 10 years ago where every deck that you saw had the words artificial intelligence in the deck. And then a few years later, every deck had the words blockchain in the deck. Now every deck has the word metaverse in the deck. So it's a it's premium edition jargon that gets added into a lot of narratives in the space. But the idea is the emergence of a virtual dimension within which great value can be created and achieved. What does that actually look like practically? Traditionally, people have thought of it as a virtual environment that you interact with through haptics or through brain-computer interfaces or through virtual reality rigs. And that is probably going to be the case in 20 years' time. Um, I think in the nearer term, what we're likely to see is a digi-physical landscape that's accessed through lens technology, so contact lenses and glassware, that emerges in limited form around us. Um, so as you walk out onto the street, we can see signage that's directed specifically to us, or we can see landscaping that is according to customizations that we've made or our data um, subscriptions that we've acquired. Um, it also means new interactive semi-intelligence agents. So when people ask the question, well, when will we know that we've arrived in the metaverse? My response is always virtual pets. 
when you begin to, when you can create a virtual pet and that semi-virtual agent can, can come with you in a digi-physical environment that can interact with both the physical infrastructure around you, other human individuals and other virtual agents as well, that's when we know we've arrived in the metaverse. Everything that we're seeing now is a preamble. They're signals of the inevitability of it. Sure, you know, plays you earn games and yield-bearing digital assets, etc. the emergence of cryptocurrency, and most importantly, the wealth created by cryptocurrency, billions and billions and billions of dollars of native crypto wealth is now focusing on this idea that it, they're indigenous to, the idea of the metaverse. And they're investing in these spaces, they're investing through DAOs, and oftentimes instead of through company vehicles, they're piling money into metaverse propositions. And some of these metaverse propositions are already worth significantly more than major traditional businesses that we see, whether that be banks or car companies or airlines. Some of these metaverse propositions that no one's heard of are obviously are already valued, uh, valued more than them. But I'll stop there. But the metaverse is a concept. So it's an interactive, immersive dimension within which creativity is boundless and we can all create a world of our own design. That, to me, is what the metaverse is interactive, interoperable, and it's still a number of years away. And the first iteration of it is likely going to be digi-physical, and it will provide significant new commercial opportunities at the retail institutional level. That's great. Very fascinating. And I look forward to that. Um, we have only five minutes left now. So I, I really want to talk about cybersecurity because, you know, you're all, um, you know, uh, leaders of companies that are sitting on a lot of data, but you're also this cybersecurity is also a cyber breach is also one of the biggest risks at the moment for um, you know companies. So I want to know what what are you all doing to ensure that you know one uh, your customers are safe, their data is safe, and also how to protect generally against cybersecurity uh, against any sort of cyber attacks. What can banks and what can um, fintech companies do better? really. Um, so yeah, 30 seconds each, please. And then we'll go to closing thoughts. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, fighting uh, against um, cyber crime and, and, and frauds, etc. is a never ending story. So within Nickel, we invest, of course, a lot of money in, um, in, in, the, in cyber security. Uh, and, uh, and, and we use all the technology available on the market to, to, do, to do this. So we built an um, uh, algorithm to, to monitor fraud and the risk of fraud. We use an um, uh, artificial intelligence system, mach machine learning, etc. cetera. So, so really, I think this is a topic uh, um, that we have to put constantly in our top of mind. And, uh, and yes, we, we have to invest constantly a, a great part of our development to secure our system and 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 to and to uh, I mean and to 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 ensure the, our client that their assets are, are secured within within Nickel and and within all uh, the banking the banking system. But really, I think it's a never-ending story, <laughs> and uh, because uh, uh, criminals are also uh, very innovative as well, and so and so this is one of our top priority and it will remain our top priority for a long time, I think. Thank you. Um, Catherine. Uh, I was recently at Money 2020 in Las Vegas, which was back in person as if there was never a pandemic, but what was really fascinating, two things to me. One is how many companies I'd never heard of before that have sprung up in the last couple of years and what percentage of them are actually focusing on this very specific issue and you just can't rest because the bad guys aren't resting. And so you have to stay in front of it. You have to try every single possible technology that you think will help stay ahead of them because they catch up really, really quickly. Using, using something that's five years old is much too old. Great, John. This is, this is so far from my domain of knowledge, I shouldn't comment on it. Tomorrow and Katrina are, are far better place to, to talk to it than I am. I got hacked recently um, and cleared out of, of one account, so I am definitely not the right person to, uh, to uh, provide knowledge education to the audience on um, cybersecurity at the moment. So. 
All right. Well, we've got some very interesting comments there. Um, it's time to wrap up, but um, I want you all, I love doing this, um, to, wear, to look into a crystal ball for me and tell me what is your vision for the coming decade? Where do, so give me give me two predictions. One, where do you see the future? What, is, what do you think about the future of banking? And second, where do you see us, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis COVID in 10 years time? What do you think things will, will over the next decade, how do you see things changing. Um, so give me your predictions, those two predictions. One, future of banking. Second, us vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Um, so I want to start with Catherine. Let's go. Um, banks aren't going anywhere. We need them. They know what they're doing and how to make sure money gets from one place to another place globally. So I think that nothing's going to change there. You might see some acquisitions and consolidation in fintechs um, as banks you know, move more and more into new technology. But I think you're going to see some companies they're out there to help provide them with core infrastructure, um, technologies that will help them accelerate their, their development. And from a COVID perspective, gosh, I mean, if you look back to 100 years ago with um, the Spanish flu, which I know wasn't really a Spanish flu, um, you know, it was, it was you know, a decade before people were not thinking about it and worrying about it. I think we're going to be wearing masks 10 years from now. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, uh, about the future of banking, uh, really, um, I think that the, the survivors within 10 years will be the one offering the best customer experience in education with customer needs and with a sustainable uh, business model in terms of revenue, costs, values, etc. So that's for the future of banking. Uh, and uh, as regards to, to COVID, I think that probably new, new threats we, will, uh, will emerge, but I really trust uh, our the, the health uh, industry to provide us with uh, vaccines and with uh, and with medication and to to I mean to overcome these uh, kind of epidemics. Let's say. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you, and John. And I, I think we're at the the beginning of a decade of great change. I think we're it's it's similar to one of those decades, post war decades where the world just looks entirely different at the end of it than what it looked at the beginning, technologically, socially, economically. And I think what happens with inflation and interest rates will determine an awful lot of that. We've got quite clearly got a massive social mobility crisis. And if it's not fixed, it is going to result in gradual destruction of democratic processes, undermining of capitalist processes in developed world economies. And that could all happen in the course of this decade. So I think interest rates will determine and a lot of the evolution of the decade and where banks situate within that. One big issue that banks have is that even if interest rates go up and banks become more profitable again, they're now competing for talent with companies they never competed with before. You know, where they were the top employer and a very, very attractive employer, what kids come out of school now and want to work in a bank? That's a really difficult challenge to solve for in the long term, to get the best and the brightest in to drive companies forward. So that's something we'll need to resolve for. Um, as to COVID, I, I agree with Catherine that well, I think we'll still be dealing with in 10 years. In 10 years, we probably had two more respiratory pandemic threats, at least. And I suspect that given the nature of this one, we're still dealing with the longer term consequences of, of cognitive issues caused by the disease and also longer term organ health related issues for a large, large population of people. And we're still, I think in 10 years time, we still won't have a clear picture of how many people globally were actually impacted by this. It'll take maybe 30, 40 years before historians are able to do that sort of analysis. So I think we're like a lot of these major events we're at the very beginning, not even close to the middle. Great. Thank you. On that note, thank you so much, everyone. It was a great panel. I really enjoyed myself. I hope you did as well. Um, so special thank you to John, Catherine, and Thomas, and to all of you for watching. Um, watch the space for more uh, and you know, stay in touch with us. Hashtag Webit. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Over to you, Webit.